You and I have a calling to rescue God's chosen people. I believe we have. It's time for us to move past the threshing floor. It's time for us to move past the river and to begin our mission. God has called us and he's promised to be with us. In Matthew 28, verse 18, there's a very familiar passage. And it's Jesus talking to the disciples. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. What does this mean to us as a church? We often have mission statements about how we're going to share the gospel. We talk a lot about God's goodness, about his soon return. But what does that mean to us? What's the reality here? See, I would ask you to prayerfully consider your calling. We cannot continue on a path as a church that we have for the past years. As Jeremy said, I'm no stranger to this church. Back in the 80s, we moved here. I went to the academy for four years. I've been a deacon in this church. I've I've sat in the pews many, many weeks. And part of that problem was I sat in the pews for virtually my entire time in this church. I didn't do anything that really required God's help. I didn't do anything that I couldn't do in my own human strength or ability. I didn't step out of my comfort zone. I didn't even lay out a fleece to see what was going on and if God was with me. You see, it's easy to read your lesson, to come to church, to sit in a pew, and to do what good Christians ought to do, at least outwardly. We come to church, we look the part, we act the part, and then we go home until next week. But what about our mission? What about the commission that God has given us to reach others? How earnestly, how seriously do we take that? It's important to remember that unless we're following God, unless we are with him, we could be lost. Last night I came and I talked to the academy about what would Jesus do. And the premise to what would Jesus do, it's a question. But the question really shouldn't be such a question to us. We should be very aware of what Jesus did and live in him And then there won't be a question. We will do as Jesus did. In Acts chapter 5, there's some advice from a very prominent, well-respected man named Gamaliel. They had hauled the disciples in before the, 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 um, the elders there. And they were on trial yet again for sharing the truth. And the more they heard, the angrier they became until they were furious and plotting to kill the disciples. When Gamaliel stood up and he asked the disciples to be dismissed, and he talked with the the people there and he reasoned with them. And he said, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. 
For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about a hundred, joined him. He was slain, and all those who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After him, or after, after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. The reality is God has called us. He's given us a mission. We need to be on God's side. We need to be one with Christ to fulfill this mission. If not, we will be referred to as somebody. Somebody named Judas from some town. Yeah, he had a bunch of people following him. And when he died, nothing came of it. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It's fair to remember that in the parable in Matthew 20 of the vineyard and the workers, only the workers who went to the vineyard and work were paid. And there was dispute about the pay at the end of the day. Some who had worked more and less, they all were paid the same. But the reality is they all had gone to the vineyard and worked. Has Christ called you to work? Matthew 25, there's a story of servants who were given talents of gold to, to care for while their master was away. Two of those servants invested and had great return on their investment and they were called good and faithful servants one servant however took his single talent he buried it for safekeeping and when the master came back he proudfully said look I still have it I didn't lose it he had been given a gift but he did nothing with it he held it selfishly to himself and then tried to give it back in fact the Lord was not pleased he was a wicked servant. He was thrown out. What he had was taken and given to someone else. I want to be found to be a good and faithful servant. This is a daunting task. When you think about the world outside these walls, when you think about our community, when you think about the Finger Lakes region, your church district, when you think about central New York, all of New York State, when you finally look at the world as a whole, it seems like a daunting task. Can they even be numbered, those who don't know about Jesus? Do we have a number? I don't know that we do. But does it matter? Gideon with 300 men went up against an army that couldn't be numbered. Are we going to have doubts? I believe we are. I do. It's easy to be, to overthink things, to, to get nervous, to, to wonder if what you're doing is really what God called you to do. But God is a patient God. He was for Gideon, and he still is today. And he's called us to work in his vineyard. He's called us to seek and to save the lost. For evangelism to work in our churches, it needs to work in our hearts first. We need to have revival personally before our churches can be revived. 
Would you prayerfully join me in examining your own life and seeking God's will? We have no way of knowing how long we have to do this work. There's a lot of room in this church to bring people in. We have a lot of empty pews that we could fill with people who don't know about Jesus. People who, whose lives are hurting and need his love. People who don't have any hope and need to know that there's a Savior who promised to give them hope and a future. In fact, we're not even promised tomorrow. How do we know how long we have in our own lives to live to do this work? See, you're the only person who can choose how your story will be written. Samson's story is written and recorded for all time. It is what it is. I'm sure his parents would have loved to change it. And I think Samson in his time in prison, blind, grinding grain, had many regrets and wished he could change it. Gideon had a good start. But if you read toward the latter part, he didn't make all the best decisions at the end either. And I believe he would have liked to have probably rewritten some of his story as well. So today, wherever you are with your story of your life, Christ can take it and write it from here forward. If you're at the end of your life and you feel like you're down to your last chapter, let Christ make that the best one of the entire book. If you're just getting started, let him start it for you. Let him write the foreword to your life story. Because how will your story be told by others matters how you live your life today. Are you willing to let God write your life story in any way he chooses. In my notes, I underlined the word any. Because when we submit to God, we don't get to make all the choices. Gideon would have quit if he started with 300 men. I think initially he felt somewhat hopeful at the turnout. I know these days, if there's a church work bee, Steve and 300 men showed up, you'd be elated. He had a little more than a church work bee, but when it came down to just he and a few others, it was a daunting task. Are we willing to trust God? Are we willing to move ahead if that's what it looks like? Are we willing to let go of our house, our community, our home, where we live here today, the people we know, to go reach someone else somewhere else if God calls us? See, if we really say that we're willing to live for Christ, if we really say that we're looking forward to his return, we can't put any limits on God. Often we say that because we're looking for God to bless us and we don't want to limit his blessing us. We also don't want to limit God's ability to use us. So if you're willing today to say to God, write my life story any way you choose, would you please stand with me today? It's a serious commitment. And I want you to think seriously about what you're saying. Because I can't tell you what God's going to ask of you. I'm not sure what he's going to ask of me. And sometimes it makes me nervous to think about it because I don't know. But the reality is, I believe that unless we really give ourselves wholeheartedly to God, he can't use us. He can't reach the world around us. Our time is short but it's not our time alone that we're concerned about. As we stand here today, 
we need to be also concerned equally, if not more so, for the people outside the church, those who haven't heard about Christ's love, those who don't know about the hope and the future he's promised. The reality is we can't carry a message we don't have and we can't do this on our own. We can't afford to waver. We can't afford to wait. Time is short and we need to be about our mission. Dear God, our Father, it's humbling to know that as we stand here today that you are the same God. You are the same God who stood at that river as Gideon was left with only 300. You are the same God who came to call him knowing full well that he would have questions and doubts. Lord, I know each one of us here are going to face those same questions and doubts. We may not even be able to go out at first. We may sneak out in the dark, Lord, to do your work. But I pray, Lord, that as we would take a step forward, that you would hold us up, Lord, that you would encourage each one here to take that second step to follow, Lord, in your path, to know your will for each one of our lives, Lord. And as you were victorious, Lord, in working with Gideon, I pray that you would have the same victory here, Lord, with this small group, this small company, this church, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on lives committed to you, Lord, lives willing to take a change, willing to step out in faith, not knowing what that means, but knowing that it means this, that we are committed to you and you are committed to us to the end of the age. So Lord, now I pray a special blessing on each one here. Be with us and guide us. Bless us and keep us until we can rejoin you in heaven with many others. Amen. Closing hymn today is 183, I Will Sing of Jesus' Love.
Dear Father, I pray that that would be our song as we leave here today, that we would sing of your love for us. Lord, it's our testimony, our lives, that will save another person as they see how you have worked in us. They will catch a vision of how you can work in their lives. Be with us now that this song would be on our heart. Amen.